Hello everyone and as the first thing thank you to the HESD UK to give me their possibility to talk to you. I am Dr. Ulrike Steuerwald living either in Torschafen, that's in the Faroe Islands or in Hannover in Germany. My focus in GSD are the ketotic GSDs and today I want you to go with you through some do's and don'ts for those with ketotic GSDs that might help you to improve your metabolic control. For the do's I have used a green thumb up for things you better avoid, the red thumb down. But before we start, I have to take you through some basics that will enable you to understand why I came to these ideas. First, how does the body stabilize your blood sugar by using glycogen? And what is happening in GSD 3, 6 and 9? And once again, what is happening in GSD 0, because that's a little bit different from 3, 6 and 9. And then what can the body do in these four types of GSD to get blood sugar up again, even if it can't use the glycogen? How does the body keep blood sugar stable by using glycogen? Most of the carbohydrates will be transformed into glucose that then through something called glucose 6-phosphate will be stored as glycogen that's mostly happening in the liver and in the muscles. If blood sugar is falling, then glycogen can, can be broken down back into glucose. The liver is able to set free glucose into the blood, where the other organs mostly use this sugar themselves. Why does this not work in persons with ketotic GSDs? I will show you in the next slides. Okay, we'll start with type 3, 6 and 9. What goes wrong here? The buildup of glycogen is just as it is supposed to be. But the breakdown of glycogen doesn't work. So you start to store glycogen. Your liver is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And your blood sugar continues to fall. If not, and we are going to, go to talk about that in a few moments. In GSD0, that is a little bit different because these people won't build up glycogen. The glycogen synthetase is the enzyme that is defect. So they don't have any glycogen to stabilize their blood sugar later on. After a meal, where is the glucose going in these people? It can't go up to the glycogen, so it has to be diverted to lactate. So you can find an elevated lactate in these people after a meal. Their alternative pathway to get a blood sugar up again in between the meals is the same as it is in 3, 6 and 9. And that's what we are going to look at. So what's that mechanism that will help you to get your blood sugar up again if you are not able to use your glycogen? It's something called gluconeogenesis that describes how glucose is made from protein. If your blood sugar is falling down and you can't get it up again from glycogen, 
the body will start and use protein, mostly protein from the muscle. Some of this protein will be transformed into pyruvate and via glucose sex phosphate can be made into glucose, so your blood sugar is getting up. At the same time, a little bit of the protein will become to acetyl CoA, and something that is even more important, fat will be mobilized and also be transformed into acetyl CoA. Acetyl CoA then becomes ketones. And if you now only look at the blood sugar, you'll say great stable blood sugar and you easily might miss a period of low blood sugar, a hypoglycemia, if you don't look at the ketones. And that's why we recommend not only checking glucose, but also the ketones. Okay, so now we are ready to go back to the do's and don'ts. The first thing you best should avoid is a period of low blood sugars, hypoglycemia. What are low blood sugars? You can see two numbers here that I took from some books, but be careful that might be very different for you. Each person has a different level of blood sugar when he or she starts to feel symptoms or when his or her body start to use counter regulations and that might be with levels that are much higher. What does a hypo feels like? You all know different symptoms that might arise with low blood sugars. And as you can see on the right side of the picture, the list is going down from not so serious troubles to very severe complications like a blackout and seizures. So be careful. If you experience several hypoglycemias and prolonged hypoglycemias, problems will become even worse as your body will stop giving you the alarm signs of hypoglycemia. We call that hypoglycemia-associated autonomic failure. And this might lead to a situation where you don't know that your blood sugar is going lower and lower and the first sign you will feel will be the signs of a very severe hypoglycemia. Recurrent low blood sugars affect your brain. You will have trouble, troubles to remember things and to learn new things. Especially in type 9, we know that recurrent hypoglycemia are clearly correlated with hyperactivity. How can you prevent the hypoglycemia? That's an easy question. Everyone should know that frequent small meals and, very important, take your cornstarch or glyphosate or manioc or whatever you have in your dietary schema. Let's go on. Now we have a do it and that is check your blood sugars and your blood ketones. As you know, low blood sugars will lead to elevated ketones. And who of you knows the symptoms of high ketones? 
they are somewhat similar to low blood sugars, but some additional signs. Headache, bellyache, nausea, and you might even start vomiting. On one side, ketones are not toxic because the brain can use them as kind of an alternative fuel, especially after some time of slightly elevated ketones. But on the other side, elevated ketones can give you troubles. They can lead to bone thinning, osteoporosis. So your bones are no longer strong, but weak. Elevated ketones will lead to growth delay and to delay puberty. The three kids that you can see on the right side, they are all the same age. And look at the boys with the GSD and the girl with no GSD, quite a difference. And something I hate most, if you already had some changes in your liver, especially some liver fibrosis that will worsen and might, might go further to liver cirrhosis by ketones. So try to have not too high ketones. Avoid the ketones. That's why I recommend that people regularly should check their ketones. Another thumb up. Protein. Very good for all those with ketotic GSD. Why? Low blood sugars will cause protein deficiency. Do you remember if your blood sugar is going low, the body will start and use the protein from the muscles to stabilize blood sugar. Okay, and then you have the ketones. But if you have too much, too often hypoglycemia, you'll feel it in your muscles. I often hear from the parents of children with ketotic GSDs that these kids might ask in the morning to be carried for breakfast. And if you ask them why, they say, oh, I have pain in my legs. I'm too weak. And I guess that's because they have to use their muscles during the night to keep their blood sugar stable. And that is interesting enough, not limited to type 3A. Type 3A is a typical muscle GSD type. But also in the other ketotic types, they also very often report weak muscles. You can see very sparse muscle mass. And you will often observe that these people grow very slow and very late because they use their protein not for growing, but to keep their blood sugar stable. How can you avoid a protein deficiency? That is very easy. First, be mindful about adding protein to your diet. You might have to use some protein powder or supplements, especially during periods of growth. But the most important thing is avoid hypoglycemia. But it's not enough to avoid low sugars. High blood sugars is nearly as bad. Why? Too many carbohydrates, especially simple sugars, will lead to an elevated blood sugar, or as we also call it, hypoglycemia. What's bad with hypoglycemia? You see, hypoglycemia might result in the end in hypoglycemia. Now you think that I got crazy. 
Now, now look at this. If you eat too many carbohydrates, your body starts to expect very high carbohydrate levels and very high levels of sugar. Then the body will try to get these sugars into a normal range by producing insulin. That's a substance that will get the sugar down. And after a certain time, the body starts to overproduce this insulin that will say you produce more insulin than you actually need for the sugar levels at the moment. This too much insulin will lead to a drop of the blood sugar. And you again get a low blood sugar and will show all the signs of hyperglycemia and want to eat even more. Perhaps interesting for you to know how can you differentiate this kind of hyperglycemia caused by too much insulin from a hyperglycemia that is caused by a lack of carbohydrates. That's very easy. If your blood sugar is low because of too much insulin, you won't have ketones in your blood. Good to know. Okay, so if you eat more and more carbs, in the end, you'll become overweight, not good. So what can you do that your blood sugars are not getting too high? How can you prevent the hyperglycemia? First, limit your carbohydrate consumption. Have a look how much carbohydrates are in your meal. Very strictly limit the consumption of simple sugars because that's what's getting the blood sugar up mostly. And be aware of the intake of fibers. Add some protein to your food and add some fat. That sounds strange, but three to five will result in a delayed absorption of carbohydrates from the intestine and from the gut. And thus the blood sugar is not rising that fast. As a result of the last slides, we come to this slide, do it, namely optimize your diet. The optimal diet in GSD 0, 3, 6 and 9 is frequent small meals. Usually I would recommend three main meals and some three or four snacks in between. Try to find slowly absorbable carbohydrates. For a main meal, you should limit your carbohydrates to 15 grams with a max of five grams of simple sugars. With the snacks, it is even less. Don't count cornstarch to this carbohydrates. They are on another side of the book. They don't count for the meals. Remember high fiber food that will delay the, the absorption of the carbohydrates and will lead to a much more stable blood sugar. Most will need uncooked cornstarch, at least during night, but quite a number of people also during daytime. A bedtime snack is a very good idea because if you start with a low or marginally low blood sugar and somewhat elevated ketones before you take your cornstarch, that the cornstarch will be too slow to correct this low blood sugar and you will end with a high ketones in the next morning. 
you need a lot of protein to correct for the extra protein you might need during periods of low sugars. That's especially true through this high amount of protein during growth. Most will need some supplements, especially B vitamin, and I recommend probiotics for all those who use cornstarch. The next part is a very, very important one. I think it's probably the most important one for these GSDs. Alcohol and drugs don't do that. What is bad with alcohol? Alcohol stops the gluconeogenesis that will say it will completely block your ability to produce glucose from protein. So after consumption of alcohol, you are really at a severe risk to develop a bad hypoglycemia. That gets even worse in those people who recently experienced several low hypos because their alarm clocks won't ring. You won't feel that your blood sugars are going down and so put you at a severe risk to develop brain damage that can't be corrected later. People with liver GSD have a reduced ability to break down alcohol. That will say, if you get yourself a beer or a wine, your blood alcohol levels stay high for a longer time than in other people's. So you easily might risk to lose your driving license. Something else, alcohol is a very strong toxin for your liver cells. And those poor liver cells who are already irritated by the extra glycogen, they might transform into liver adenomas, into even liver cancer. That's something we have especially observed in those with type 9A who did have elevated liver function tests during their childhood. So what about drugs? I've been frequently asked whether you, if you are not allowed to use alcohol, at least might use some drugs. I strongly recommend against drugs. You can see on the right side why. Drugs usually increase your energy demands and make blood sugars very unstable. You lose control. You won't react to all the signs of hypoglycemia. You won't remember that you are supposed to take your starch to take your meals. So I really would ask you, don't do that. The last point with drugs, even the soft drugs are not free of risks. They very often open the doors that you crave for stronger drugs. But here's again a very nice do it, something I like very much, and that is Sports. Sports, on the right side, you'll see kids, people, all suffering from different kinds of liver GSDs, and you can see how active they are. They love their sports. Sports is very, very good because it teaches your muscles 
to use fat instead of carbohydrates. That will get you some extra sugar for your brain. And it's the brain that uses most of the glucose. If you want to know which sport is best, look at those kids. I think actually you can do most kinds of sports, but I would start with not too hard sports. Usually moderate activity is best like table tennis or hiking or bicycling. Yes, how often? Very important. You should exercise at least three times a week for at least 20 minutes. Where do these numbers come from? You need other tools, other enzymes to burn fat than you use for using sugar for muscle activity. And your body will only keep these tools to use the fat if you do this exercise often enough. So we come to the summary. Some don'ts, very clear don'ts. Try to avoid low sugars, try to avoid high sugars and stay away from alcohol and drugs. Yes, please do it. Check your blood sugar and blood ketones. Your doctor will tell you how often you should do that. Be mindful about your protein intake. You'll need much more than you think, especially as long as your blood sugar is not really stable. Try to improve, to optimize your diet. Go for sports, please. And if you look at the first slides of this talk, you'll learn how GSD, especially how ketotic GSDs work in your body. And that will make it easier for you to understand what to do and what not to do. I want to thank all those people who helped me to collect these ideas, who talked to me, who told me their experiences, whether it is colleagues, whether it is patients or families, and a special thank to the group from Hartford, from the former GSD program, and my very good teacher, David Weinstein. Stay well, all of you.